Springtime's finally here, and you know what that means. Another year without demo. <laughs> By the way, the stuff the mods canonize on their own won't be put in this video. They'll be added to the canon doc, which is the final non-negotiable place for all things Ruby alternate, as well as the canon announcements. But I won't waste my time introducing stuff you can just read on your own. These are just entries that I'm adding, regardless of what anyone thinks. Well, he said he'd be taking some time off of YouTube isn't that important, but listen, I can't stand watching Mother's Space anymore! You're gonna come back here! Okay, so like, no joke, someone wrote up a thesis on how dust should work, and I think it's fairly accurate. It may be subject to change, as there is stuff in there that contradicts what I'm about to say. I'm not gonna read all of it here, so a link to that info can be found through our Discord in the canon doc. What I will talk about is the reactivity of mined or raw dust, and how dust can be refined. From our current understanding, mined dust has a reactivity on par with gunpowder. However, this begs the question of how it can be safely mined without igniting it, and how dust was able to survive the temperature of atmospheric entry when pieces of the moon rain down on Remnant, because hey, big reminder, that's where dust came from. So let's say then that dust from the moon and by extension mined dust are inert until refined. The basic refinement method begins by dissolving mined dust with alcohol and filtering out the impurities before slowly evaporating off the alcohol to concentrate the dust alcohol solution, thus encouraging crystallization as a reactive product. Alcohol is a preferable solvent because it's relatively easily produced and not found in high concentrations out in nature. Slower crystallization at lower temperatures would correlate with greater purity, as the crystal structures would be more likely to exclude impurities while assembling. This process could be repeated to repeatedly increase purity and reactivity. Conversely, Grim are able to consume and refine dust in their bodies, which would explain why older Grim contain pure dust. So based on this, we can assume the following. The moon contains a high concentration of an impurity or impurities that make dust incredibly heat stable, enough to survive atmospheric entry, yet dissolvable in refinement alcohol. Mine dust is stable enough to be mined safely using traditional methods, dust refineries and the associated supply chains for refinement alcohol would need to exist, and markets for dust of specific purity grades would emerge. We could argue further that mined dust, like crude oil, can be refined into different forms with various properties, like how oil can be made into both fuel and plastics. Purified dust can be redissolved and intentionally mixed with certain impurities or additives to produce stable crystals, powders, fibers, flexible solids, stable liquids, etc., instead of basic reactive crystals. Certain additives might act as a bonding agent so that dust can be securely applied to certain materials, such as armor or the surfaces of weapons. If you have no idea idea what the fuck I just said, don't worry about it because neither do I. With all that out of the way, let's quickly talk race. For convenience sake, names of real ethnicities will be used to easily describe Marathon's various biologies. This does not include Faunus. This is more or less the different types of base, average humans that you can find in Ruby Alternate. Diving into this, the northern part of Marathon has a Caucasian bulk, with Slavic, Anglo-Saxon, and Norwegian majorities with an Italian-Germanic minority left over from the Old Empire. The southern part of Marathon has an Arabic and Asian bulk with Chinese and Mongolian majorities and Korean and Japanese minorities. Simple, right? For localized ethnic groups in Baradinasan, there is a small but significant African minority. The principalities and the Free Banks, along with Baradinasan, have several ethnic groups that live in their own villages. These localized ethnic groups consist of many differing people, like Indians, Polynesians, Iberians, etc. Naturally, the Seiros functions as a border between what are essentially the Indo-Europeans and the rest of the world. Again, I'm only using our world's terminology for our convenience. I haven't figured out the naming of these races quite yet, or whether or not they would be subject to discrimination based on what country or culture they're in, but at least we have a racial map of Marathon to distinguish who belongs where and whatnot. I had the chance to talk about geography in the first community addendum, but I cut it out. Lol. I admit, it would probably be more useful to have this in conjunction with the geographic map of Marathon, but for now I'll just military these bad boys. Why you're do you not fucking care? No, you're not playing Terraria. I will not leave this channel, and I will not stop harassing you. You guys. <laughs> so you're no. admitting that you're harassing me. Okay, so you're I, admitting no, that you're being I'm a giant dick. You, and if you're being a dickhead, you're lying to me, 
You told me you you been a giant asshole. You and also in a military esque fashion, I'm going to dump everything you need to know about the Grafe in the cannon dock because ain't nobody got time for that. I also have a map showing where all the Grimmies are. This is more or less a concentration of Grim throughout Terria, from Marathon to the far side of the world. And while I have everyone here because it was contended to the Discord much more often than it should have been, Grimification needs to be better defined. By far the biggest issue we're running into regarding it is everyone misconstrues it for some kind of superpower or power-up that enhances how someone fights or acts, and that is not true. By no means, even if you somehow aren't killed by it, it doesn't give you special abilities outright. Maybe a horn or a tail in conjunction with exacerbated animalistic features, sure, but not fucking powers. It doesn't even affect animals, it's purely a human thing. Sorry, Obanko. By the way, Obanko's canon. Grimification, alongside the physical presence of Grim, operate as a containment protocol meant to keep humans from expanding outside Marathon. It's not literally a containment protocol, but you get the idea. It functions in practice like radiation. A little is fine, and not a lot will happen, but prolonged exposure will lead to very adverse side effects. You know, like death. In fact, I'm tempted to just outright say that for lack of research into the frontier given its adversity, Grimification is just Marathon's version of radiation poisoning. Too much poisoning and you could die. Your body might go through a physiological change for being exposed for too long, hence the nomenclature's comparison to Grim, but for the most part, if you're out there for too long, you'll either get really, really sick or straight up die. There are cases of frontiers contracting the sickness and undergoing a change in their physiology, but somehow managing to build an immunity to crimification's more adverse effects. Case in point, Riger Dotson. It's cases like these that convince groups like the Frontier's Finest to push the Grim further and further away from Marathon, despite crimification affecting every square mile past the Boro Mountains. Unlike radiation in our world, the strength of one's semblance determines just how resilient the body is to this poisoning. Tier 3 hunters, as rare as they are, can withstand almost a month in this place, while average civilians would probably start getting sick after a few days. Again, it's not the aura. Aura means nothing. It's just a word for the soul. The semblance is the extension of that soul, and is where hunters get the real power. We get on that? No confusion? Yes? Alright, moving on. The Atlan question is complicated? It's not as straightforward as one side is the kingdom and the other side is the nationalist state. It's not Republican and fascist Spain. There's a lot of political maneuvering on everyone's part, but what is apparent are the different factions. Not all these parties are against each other. Some form alliances, some cooperate, and some are outright neutral. But hey, Atlas is a fucking mess right now and here are the people trying to put it back together. I briefly mentioned it before, so let's talk about the Frontier's Finest, a small group of hunters who share a common interest in scouting and surveying the lands of the Frontier and to record any new discoveries not previously found in past expeditions. Led by veteran hunter and renowned explorer Peter Port, no relation, he runs this small group of like-minded hunters in the hopes of greater knowledge and discoveries out in the wild, dealing exclusively in frontier-related missions and brokering any information they have to anyone interested. Its doors are open to any hunter with a thirst for adventure. Side note, this is the group of hunters that mans the frontier walls past the Borough Mountains, as is their responsibility since Atlas stopped sending their own after the war in the Boros. In fact, that's kind of how they started. They're just like, ah, fuck, the Grim are gonna walk back in here. We better, we better keep them out. With tensions rising, the countries of Marathon are starting to experiment with shuttling troops and supplies around their borders. This came about in the form of taking a train and strapping plate armor and guns to it. Boom. Armored trains can be found just about anywhere from the Freebanks to the frontier walls and are assigned seven main tasks. Battleground support, intercepting the enemy, Grim included, protecting infantry flanks, supply runs, and recon. Because the frontier walls are in constant need of supplies, armored trains tend to see a lot of action past the boroughs and in the frontier. When a warning goes up, the trains are the quickest response possible. Let's move on over from the frontier walls to Beacon, which we've decided is a bit more north than what we originally had. I mean, you still get there via train, it doesn't really matter. The founding of fire teams is compulsory both to foster teamwork between students and to ensure that less experienced trainees are grouped together on assignments to ensure their safety. Whether a student is part of a fire team or not, they can apply to accompany hunters on missions or take their own assignments. Of course, applying as a fire team increases your chances of being accepted for these assignments. Joining a fire team is optional for first years, but in order to have enough credit to pass their second year at Beacon, a student must enroll in a fire team. Prior to the beginning of each academic year, applications are taken for any first or second year students wishing to join a fire team. Team members are assigned randomly into teams of four that typically share the same year, however in some cases second years without a team are paired with first years to prevent odd number teams. This is what happened with Yang, although she didn't like who she was paired with in the end, did not only benefit 
benefited Blake and Weiss, but it prevented Ruby from being a team of three, which at Beacon was unacceptable at their level of prowess. Most students choose to join a fire team right away, being the ambitious little twats they are and wanting to jump right into the frontier without any thought or consideration, Brandon! Yeah. Still, students can hold off on joining a fire team until their second year. In later years, while students are still considered to be grouped by their fire teams, if one older student graduates before the rest, they're still allowed to accompany their fire team on student missions. However, those older students are also considered capable enough to take those missions without their fire team, so they can choose to simply break away. This kind of situation varies with each hunter society, but for Beacon, they actually won't replace that older hunter if they decide to break off and do their own thing, since that three-person fire team is much more capable at that point than they were at the beginning. Beginning. So, uh, to sum things up, it's fucking complicated. Speaking of complicated... Wrapping up societies, let's talk weaponry. Semi-automatic weapons are currently in the prototype phase and require large accompanying systems to operate, so they can only realistically be made in very small numbers, and even then they're hardly mobile. So crank guns and the like can only really be useful in relatively stable, well-defended environments like forts in the Hovel Dam, sometimes entrenchments. All weapons, or at least most weapons in this time, are manually loaded. The most common method of bullet cycling is bolt action, with some people using a lever action or pump action cycle as well. Ammunition is just just gunpowder, nothing special. However, as I mentioned previously, dust can be refined into metals, powders, and, yep, gunpowder. So literal dust bullets are now in circulation, albeit not nearly as widely used as the normal stock because money. It's used a lot more in the frontier where there's a greater need for ammo that flies faster and hits harder. Take this, you fucking dust monster! Child, you're not the combination of different weapons, or masterpiece weaponry as some people call it, is a bit more strained in this setting. They are very hard to mass produce because the parts used to make them are very rare and require a considerable amount of maintenance. Average soldiers don't have the luxury of choosing when and when not to fight and check their weapon. More or less, hunters do. And because there are less of them and they rack up a considerable income, they can afford the prices weapon artisans charge for creating these specialized one-of-a-kind armaments, which if you're lucky can be created to function in tandem with your semblance. Crescent Rose, a literal scythe, is only useful if you're fast enough to use it as a halberd or a pike. Governments aren't going to waste their time mass-producing it for soldiers who can't even swing the damn thing, let alone swipe it fast enough for it to even be a weapon. Weapon. Yo, I just noticed this is a pretty short video. Was there some kind of scratch pad genocide I didn't hear about? What are you hiding? On the topic of Nora and Ren, Ren is the leader of their two-person outfit, a fledgling member of the Crusadines military specialists, yeah, we actually don't have a name for them yet, and the one who is actually doing the full-time spying, having had the most extensive training and practice on the matter. He's the straight man to their outfit, and finds many of Marathon's processes and cultures barbaric in comparison to his, often abstaining from interacting with them. Conversely, Nora was an orphan, that the Order took in as a child, trained since her induction to act as Ren's bodyguard of sorts. While their whole character is accentuated around lifting other spirits and making sure everyone is having a good time, her ultimate purpose in accompanying Ren is the fact that as an orphan, she's expendable and, above all else, honor-bound to protect Ren with her life. And although Ren was taught to see her as nothing more than an expendable bodyguard, he often pities her. As a result, this leads to an oddly similar version of Ren and Nora, where Nora acts like she's constantly joined to Ren at the hip. She's boisterous, energetic, and flies off the handle because she's constantly antsy. And Ren, being the more collected one, acts as the voice of reason that keeps her and the tone of the story in check. In fact, the more I think about it, Nora and Lee Ren are just an analogy for creating Ruby Alternate, like two separate modes of thinking you can find anywhere in the Discord. How much from the original show do we keep? Do we like its lighthearted tone? Are we getting off track? Are we being too serious? What do we replace? What's the ultimate goal? Are we on the same page? The only real difference is, unlike Lee Ren, I don't pity Ruby for Former. I want to see it die alone. Carrying over from the frontier's finest, Peter Port is a grizzled and experienced hunter slash explorer who partook in many expeditions into the frontier on a quest to capture what I once saw onto video. This is the portal to hell. 
Why don't you come on out of that hole and get me? To uncover the unknown and record his findings, forming a small group of like-minded hunters to explore, survey, chart research, and study the adversities the frontier has to offer, Hort's only real goal is to inspire a generation of explorers to beat back the darkness and tame the West. And then you're gonna walk over the lava lamp, but guess what? By then we're gonna be sold out, and there's gonna be no reason to come back if you even get the chance, because you'll be gone! But let's see! He's one of the Church of Beacon's many teachers and obviously is one of their most celebrated. Who we formerly know as Cordovan was born to a high-ranking officer and a war hero of the Torian military in the early days of their unification campaigns. Awed by her stories of her father and her grandfather and all her ancestors, she grew up wanting to join the military as well. However, as I'm sure you all know, Torian conscription laws bar women from active service. So, when she was old enough, she moved away from home and enlisted disguised as a man. For years, years she served in the Torian military, climbing up the ranks and becoming a well-respected general in her many offensives against the surrounding states. No one, except maybe a few trusted individuals, knows that she is a woman. In fact, Cordovan was just a fake name. No one really knows what her real name is. Well, wouldn't they notice her voice? What about her boobies? Don't ask questions, let the ghost come inside you. These are our ghost adventures. Topping off characters is the long-awaited story of the fall of the Imperial Crown. Herein lies the rise of Winter as a political figure and, albeit less detailed, the ascension of John Nikos to the leadership of Atlas. All in all, uh, pretty important shit. Although I have my reservations on the climax of it all, this is the general gist of what Winter's character is all about. So fuck it. And... Yeah, that pretty much concludes our video. It feels shorter than last time, is it shorter? What do you think, post-commentary Jerry? It's me! It's Hog Guy! Hello, Hog Guy!